a book that is often overlooked because of its very short brevity, um, some time, about two weeks of study. I'd like for us to kind of look at the background of Philemon this week and then look at the text of Philemon next week uh, for two, two reasons why. Number one, to learn more about a book that is often overlooked that many people don't know a lot about, which is always a wonderful thing to do, especially about the Bible. All right, but the intro to Philemon. So Philemon is a book you know, that's written by, anybody want to guess? Paul, right? That's one of the Paul's epistles. And so this is Pauline authorship during his imprisonment, okay? This is not the imprisonment that he has before he is killed. That imprisonment will take place about five years later. This imprisonment takes place, and he writes um, two other books during this imprisonment. Anybody know which one's written during this imprisonment? Colossians and Ephesians. And so these are some of the prison epistles that Paul is going to write and that he's going to have delivered by the same guy that delivers Philemon, the, the letter of Philemon, who also brings Onesimus back to him. And so Paul is the author. It takes place about five to six years before he is uh, beheaded. The letter is addressed to Philemon. Now, we don't know a whole lot about Philemon. He's not mentioned a lot of times in the Bible. But if we look from the letter of Colossae, and if we also look from the letter of Philemon, there are some things that we can learn about this Philemon character. Okay, this Philemon guy, he is the owner of a slave Onesimus, which means he is not a slave himself. He is a man of some substance. He's a man of some wealth. We don't know how many slaves he has, but he's wealthy enough to have at least one slave. Okay, he's a member of the church at Colossae. And so we do know from Paul's letter to the Colossian congregation, had Paul been to Colossians before? Anybody want to guess? Fit if it's chance. Raise your hand if it's yes. Raise your hand if it's no. There's like six people. I was just too afraid. Look, if you're wrong, it won't bother me at all. I promise. I don't think any less of you. You know, once you're so low, there's only there's only there's no space left to go. No, just playing. All right. No, seriously. If you think it's yes, raise your hand. And I understand for for some of you, it's just a wild guess. It's okay. If you think it's no, raise your hand. All right. A lot more voted yes than no. That's unfortunate because it's no. Because it appears that Paul had not been to Colossae because he writes a letter to Colossians. He says he hasn't been there yet, but Philemon is a member of the congregation at Colossae and Paul says he baptized Philemon. So where was Philemon baptized? Somewhere else. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us, but it must have been somewhere else, right? But Philemon lives in Colossae now, or maybe he's always been in Colossae, but was traveling. He linked up with Paul somewhere, maybe in Ephesus. We know Paul was there for about 18 months. He spent quite a bit of time in Ephesus. Those two congregations are not that far apart. And so maybe Philemon met up Paul there. But Paul tells us in the letter of Philemon that he baptized Philemon. Okay? And so, apparently, Philemon became a Christian through Paul's ministry, verse 19 of Philemon. At the same time, he must, have, he must not have been in Colossae at the time of his conversion, for Paul hadn't been there yet. And we can see that in the letter of Colossae, or letter to the congregation at Colossae, in Colossians 1.4. And he also reiterates that in Colossians 2.1. And so it's kind of interesting, all right? Is Philemon the slave? No, I'm just checking to see if you guys are awake this morning. Okay, Philemon is not the slave. He is the slave owner. Okay, the major theological issue is slavery. What were Paul's options and what, were, what did he say? And so you may think that, Isaac, we don't really live in a day and age where slavery exists. I don't really see. One of the reasons we don't read Philemon is because it's about two guys. One's a slave, one's a slave owner. And that doesn't mean anything for us today. Well, actually, if you look at the context of Philemon, Philemon has a lot more to do with what we go through today, and we might think just on the surface. How many times have you heard about social inequality or equality in the last 10 years? A lot. Well, you hear it a lot because it is a big deal. I mean, you know, we have different, we can have different theories about the cause, the, uh, how, how bad it is, if it is there. But the, the idea of social inequality or the problem of social equality has been here as long as humans have existed and will be here as long as humans continue to exist on the earth. The question is, what do we as Christians do? What is our response to it? And so, slavery. And we're going to spend a lot of time this morning talking about slavery because we really got to set the context of what is being talked about and what is going on in this letter. And so we need to talk about that. Slavery, there are two types. Hebrew slaves and foreign slaves in the Old Testament. You have two different laws for two different types of people. 
Now, slavery has only recently been in terms of, of racial, all right? If you look at slavery that took place in the North Atlantic slave trade, that took place in the Americas, um, and also the Caribbean, it was based upon race, right? But in the ancient world, slavery was not based upon race. Anybody from any race or any background could be a slave. And so in the Hebrew world, you had two types of slaves. Your fellow Hebrew brothers, okay? They were only hired servants. It kind of be like indentured servitude. And a lot of times it was for debt or for theft, and so if someone was deeply in debt, they would imprison themselves, if you will, working for somebody else, or if they had been caught as a thief, the family can free them. So if your son has stolen something and he's got to work for four years to pay that off, that individual, the family can come together, raise the funds, and buy him out of his servitude. And they're all free every seventh year. It's called the year of Jubilee. Right? And so every seventh year, the slaves are freed. Okay? Now, for foreign slaves, it's a little bit different. Okay? They're usually from war. They could harbor uh, foreign slaves for time and sell them. And some religious privileges, privileges that you could not make your slaves work on the Sabbath. Uh, they had to have the Sabbath day off just like you did. And if you look at the slave system in the ancient world, the way Hebrews treated their foreign slaves was vastly better. I mean, I know some people will look at the Bible and say, well, how could the Bible be God's written word? It talks about slavery, and <laughs> slavery is inhumane and so bad. If you look at the way slaves were treated in uh, Israel versus the way slaves were treated in Assyria at the same time, it's vastly different. The Hebrews are way, way nicer and more kind to their slaves than the other ones. Okay? And so slavery in the New Testament. Um, let's see. If, uh, okay, let me see this. All right, no, okay. All right, sorry. All right, this is uh, slavery in the New Testament, okay? It was for other reasons. You could have slavery for kidnapping, slavery for debt, uh, self-sale to avoid poverty. And you were just like, man, Leroy, I know I owe you 20 grand, and you might get mad and kill me one day. How about I come and like work for you for a couple of years and we call it even? Like, it's pretty common back then. And so, offspring of slaves. So if you were a slave, you had a kid, he's a slave. Military captivity. You fight in a battle, you lose. You and your wife and kids are slaves. The penal system, all right? You didn't sit in an iron cell and get food. When Paul was in prison, prison in the ancient world was to await trial. Okay, that was so you didn't run away. They put you in chains until you go before the judge. And the judge either says, let them go or beat the mess out of them or, put them, or make them a slave. Like, that's the three options in the ancient world. And so when Paul's in, in prison, he's waiting to get his sentence. All right? Unwanted children sometimes were given to slaves, or they would just sell their own kids. All right? Now, slavery in the ancient Hebrew Bible is different. I was talking to a lady one time. She was an older lady, wonderful lady. Um, she came from a very wealthy family in Nashville, one of the largest slave owners in Nashville, during the uh, southern slave trade. And this was a very touchy subject for her because she got really offended if we said slavery was bad, uh, which I know sounds kind of odd. But she would say, in the blood of Philemon, Paul sent the slave back. He didn't say you were supposed to let him go, which was actually one of the reasons uh, that southern Christians, if you will, would argue for slavery. But if you look at Exodus 21.16, it says, He who kidnaps a man, whether he sells him or he is found in his possession, shall surely be put to death. And then in Deuteronomy 5, 13-15 says, Six days you shall labor from all that you do, to all that you work. But on the seventh day, the Sabbath, you shall give them rest, the Lord your God. It is not in you that you shall work, you or your son, your daughter, your male servant, or your female servant, or your ox, or your donkey, or any of your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you, so that your male servant, your female servant, may rest well with you. You shall remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. And then he goes down, if you look at the New Testament, in 1 Timothy 1, 8-11, he gives a list of immoral things that will not inherit the kingdom of God. He talks about those who profane the, uh, God's name, those who hit their mothers and fathers, murderers, sexually immoral, men who practice homosexual, homosexuality, liars, perjurers, whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. In that list, he mentions enslavers. And so um, the way that slavery was used in the United States during the uh, 17th through 19th centuries um, was condemned by death in the Old Testament and said to be unholy in the New Testament. Yes, Steve. 
Yeah. The, the idea that they were property were, uh, that's what a slave was, was your property. And even in the New Testament, they're considered to be property. But that property still had certain rights, if you will. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, they have less rights. Now, the question is, do they have a view of being like subhuman? Um, which was kind of the, the, the air of, of racial... Oftentimes, racial slavery is due to the fact that they find them to be kind of a subhuman... Uh, they're less humane than you are. Well, in the ancient world, they had less rights because they were of a lower status. Um, just like anybody. I mean, even if you're a free man, if you have less money than somebody else, you have less rights. Um, just like uh, even in the United States. Um, you could be a free man, but for a while you had to be a free man and own property in order to vote. Did that make you any less of a man? No. But did it make you have less rights? Yes. And so even though they had better situation than other nations around them, even though they had less rights, they were still given more, uh, more, I, I'm, I'm trying. I'm having a hard time finding the word I'm trying to say. More um, credence, more. Yeah, yeah, more respect than uh, than like the North American slave trade was during this system. If that makes sense. Yes. Um, they were probably Hebrew slaves. Uh, there could have been some captives. Uh, but you'll see more of that whenever they go in and take the land of Canaan and they start acquiring more and more of those tribes um, that, that some of them they kill all outright and some of those they take into slaves. So that's probably why they, it wasn't forbidden because they were not. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and it's, the ancient world is different than us. It was just assumed that you were going to have slaves, which I know for us today sounds so weird. Like it just, you know, but you have to think of a time before modern, modern banking system. You know, like if you're a Dave Ramsey fan, you know, one of the things he always says is the borrower is slave to the lender. You know, it's a, it's a passage from the Bible. Well, it's literal because if you, if you owed money to somebody back then, I mean, now if we owe 20 grand on a credit card, we're like, oh, snap, I should pay that off. You know, that's financially unwise. 2,000 years ago, it was like, oh, snap, they're going to come take my kids and sell them, you know, or put my husband or wife in, in slavery. You know, and so, so it was a literal, it was like a literal thing back then. And today we're kind of still slaves somebody else if we owe them, but we're just, we don't, we don't see it as slavery because those boundaries are not as crossed, if that makes sense. Actually, people say, oh, snap, I should declare bankruptcy, you get out of my bed. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, that's another option that wasn't there in the ancient world, right? And so, but yeah, that's a, it's a, it's a great question about Ex Exodus 21. And so, the takeaway, Paul fought slavery through love and emphasis on equality. Um, in Ephesians 6, verse 9, he reminds those who are overseers that they have masters in heaven. Paul, the Bible doesn't say anywhere in the New Testament that you cannot own slaves, but it does relegate very strictly how you are to act with those slaves. In Ephesians 6, 9, it says that you've got to treat them well because you've got a master in heaven. And if you treat them uh, poorly, your Heavenly Father will treat you poorly. He reiterates that in Colossians 4, verse 1. There are, there are those in the congregation who own slaves. We know that because who's in this congregation at Colossae? Philemon, and he owns slaves. And then Galatians 3, 28-29 tells us that we're all one in Christ Jesus. And so, um, so Paul sends back Onesimus with Turkicus, and he's a native of Asia. He's also a fellow brother of Paul. He's mentioned in Ephesians, Colossians, also in Acts 20 and 2 Timothy chapter 4 and Titus 3. And so Onesimus is sent back by Paul with a letter, and uh, he goes back to Colossae to Philemon, his overseer, with a letter from Paul. And so in early Roman Empire, it is estimated that out of all the individuals in the empire, a third to a half were slaves. The Hebrew economy did not depend on slavery. The Greco-Roman economy depended on slavery. Like the Roman Empire would actually go to war with nations around them. Not to take their land. And not take their stuff. But just because they needed more slaves. Like, could you imagine that? Could you imagine going out to the boundaries of your country and having war with another country? Not because they have anything to gain. Not because they're wealthy. Just because you need more people to be slaves. 
to keep your economy afloat. Think about that. And that's ancient Rome. It's estimated it took 250,000 new slaves every year just for the city of Rome. I mean, if you've seen a map, Rome is massive. I mean, it stretches from Europe all the way to you know, uh, Asia with Turkey, on through the Middle East where uh, Palestine is, all the way through northern Africa. And Rome is just the capital. It's the largest city, but it's just the capital. They need 250,000 people every year just for the economy in Rome to stay afloat. It's incredible. And so we can't fathom just how many people were slaves today. Who are nurses in here? Got any nurses? You got more nurses than that, right? Nurses is a good job. It's good living. You're not making 300 grand a year, but it's not a bad way to live. Ancient world, you're a slave. Uh, any teachers in here? Teachers? Several teachers? Okay. Good living. Nice benefits. It's hard to leave because of the insurance. I know. My wife's a teacher too. Ancient world, you're a slave. You know, any engineers in here? Anybody? No? Okay. Good income, nice way to live. Ancient world, you're a slave. And so the idea of a middle class that we have today, even good middle class jobs, teacher, nurse, engineer, whatever we have you, artisans, you're slaves. You're owned by somebody else. I mean, we don't understand the freedom that we have today. And I know this isn't like, you know, rah, rah America speech. But, I mean, you don't understand. Like in the ancient world, like everybody in this room would have had a master that would have had sovereignty over them that would have told you what to do 24-7. And there's nothing you could have done about it. We got it good. Like, we live very nicely. And so, but that was the reality for many of our brothers and sisters in the first century Christian world. And so... There's four reasons to study Philemon, right? Quality over quantity. Many people look at the book of Philemon and think, man, it's just it's like one chapter. It's like 20-something verses. You know, it's just skim over that one. It's super deep. When you start talking about how Christians are supposed to interact with people, you throw in the differences between uh, social status and classes and, and your workers and coworkers. The book of Philemon has to deal with something that's super deep, and that is how do you treat another person? We would say, well, you treat them well, Isaac. That's, you know, doing what others have them do. What if you own them? Like, what if you legally own them? How do you treat them? What if you own them and they're your brother in Christ? What if you own them? What if you have slaves and a couple of them are Christians? Do you treat them differently than you do other slaves? What if you own slaves and one of them is one of the elders at the congregation you're at that you just got baptized in or converted into. Who listens to who? Do you treat them differently? I mean, that's what Philemon's talking about. And so we look at this book and think, you know, whatever, slaves. This is super deep because this is the question is that people in the first century church were having to wrestle with, you know. And so this, this, is, this is really good stuff. It's a primary history source uh, for First Century Rome. Even individuals who don't use the Bible for religious reasons or don't think the Bible is really important will actually use Philemon because it is a, a primary source for slavery in the ancient world. It reveals how Paul's faith pervades in every action he does, and it deals with the social inequality and equality of his time. And so the main causes for slavery in the ancient world were war, birth, or poverty which covered most individuals that weren't native-born Italians or those who were extremely wealthy. And oftentimes, people just thought of these individuals as just tools. I mean, the individual was looked at like you would look at a hammer on a shelf. I mean, that's just, just kind of the way it was. They were bought and sold, and they were denied the right to human dignity. And so oftentimes, you would have manumission. And that's going to be mentioned in Paul's letter, this idea of manumission, which literally means to send away with the hand. And so, in the ancient world... Slavery was not like it was in modern America. There are some stories of slaves being freed. Um, many people don't realize this, but uh, the members of the Churches of Christ during the Civil War were uh, anti-slavery and were pacifist. And so you had men like uh, David Lipscomb. It was illegal to set your, free, your slaves free in Tennessee. He lived in Nashville. So he actually went to like Indiana or Illinois, somewhere it starts with an I, so he could set his slaves free. And then came back. And, um, and one of the reasons why there was a big argument between the congregations in the North and the South is because the congregations in the South were pacifists. They didn't fight in the Civil War. And uh, the congregations in the North did. 
And so there was some real bad blood between congregations in the north and south because the south said, you can't, can't fight and shed life and take your brother's lives uh, in warfare. And the congregations in the north were more uh, pro-war. And so just a small history lesson in the church about the Civil War and how that stuff kind of works. Uh, I know that's just kind of extra, sorry. But we can see in the early church, okay, what do we, send our, what do we use our money for? We take up. There's several things. There's several right answers. Just, just blurt it out. Missions, right? We send, we support missions, um, in, we support missions in Africa. We support missions in South America. We support them in Asia, right? We send, we send a lot of money overseas to do mission work, right? What else do we send it out? Send, use our money for benevolence. Benevolence. Pay the Paying the preacher, <laughs> right? It's true. It's true. But 1 Corinthians 9 says, that's okay, Brother Ed. I got that passage memorized, okay? Uh, but, what, what else do we spend our money on? The building. I mean, you guys wouldn't believe how much money goes into maintaining the building. It's incredible. So what do you do in the first century world where, you know, there's not a, there's not a whole lot of foreign missionaries that are going to place. We're not buying people's plane tickets to and from places. They're not paying the building or the land because they're meeting in somebody's home. A lot of what the money was spent on in the first century Christian world was to buy the freedom of slaves in the congregation. And so they would actually give their money each Sunday, and what they would do with that money is they would actually buy the freedom of members in the congregation. And so if somebody was a slave, you had a slave and you had three kids, oftentimes kids were way cheaper you know, than adults because they can't work as much. You've got to wait like 15, 18 years to get any real good stuff out of them. And you've got to feed them. And you've got to pay somebody to look after them. So they're, they're cheap. And so oftentimes they would start with the kids first. And so if there were babies that were born or young children, they would actually buy the freedom of the kids first and then work their way. Uh, Christianity was actually one of the main reasons why you see, if you could see this on a, on a chart, the world, not just in Rome, but the world and about slavery, and first century A.D. was at its height. And then it dramatically declines. Anybody know what happens in the first century A.D.? Jesus, the church, Christianity. The idea that all people are made in the image of God and that all people, that Christ died for all people. That nobody is subhuman. And so uh, the book of Philemon is extremely important in terms of that. And so uh, slavery remains, the slave is to be obedient, but the master is supposed to treat them with fairness and respect. And so it's interesting to think about the dynamic levels of the relationship. How does that work? If, you know, if a slave, you know, their, their, uh, their master is an, is an elder, or maybe perhaps you know, the elder is actually a slave of someone in the congregation. And they use funds to buy the freedom of those who were in prison. And so uh, Paul tells Onesimus, uh, Paul tells Philemon to give Onesimus grace because he has received grace. And this is the core principle of Christianity that we see in Philemon. Do we treat other people based upon how we are treated? Well, we, shouldn't. we shouldn't, right? It's really hard. I mean, it's, it's hard if somebody's mean to you not to be mean back. But that is the, that's the principle of Christianity, right? Uh, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so when Paul talks in Ephesians chapter 6, that was first about uh, five or six verses, uh, and he talks about uh, slaves and masters. You know, oftentimes we apply today to be employees and employers, because in our world that's kind of like how it is. Um, but to think about this idea that we should treat all people, regardless of what their job is, regardless of what their rights are, regardless of where they're from, what they look like, what their background is, and we've got to treat every person with love and respect. Um, it'll change our society today because it changed societies in the first century if we would just do it. I'm not saying you don't do that. I'm just saying that I think that we've gotten to the point in our society where we treat people differently based upon their color of their skin. You know, whether they're, they're, they're black, people say, well, you know, you're black, da 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 And it's become increasingly popular today to say, well, you're white, da 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 but it's just the same thing, but it's just been reversed. You know, or you're Asian, da 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 You know, we do that. Or we look at somebody, I mean, was there ever a time, I'm a young guy, was there ever a time that a, a Democrat and Republican could sit down and have a, like a civil like Thanksgiving meal? Was there ever a time? No? They just wish, 
Probably not. Okay, I don't know if it was just now or always. You know, it's like that person's an ex. You know, they're they're an idiot and they're dumb and they're subhuman and they're they you know it's, they're racist. All kinds of stuff. And we live in a day and age where we think we've advanced so much, but at the same time, if you look around, we still have a real bad problem with treating people based upon the color of their skin or their, uh, where they're from or their country of origin or their political views. When really we should be looking at Philemon and what Paul has to say to Philemon in his treatment of, of Onesimus because I think it is important for us to be reminded. Any questions about... Um, the book of Philemon. Next week we're going to get into the text of Philemon and look at that and, um, and talk about some of the details of the letter. But I wanted to kind of just set the stage of Philemon th- this morning and talk about slavery in the uh, ancient world. Uh, yes? Who exactly were the slave owners then? Was it the government or landowners? Yeah. If there was no middle class, if everybody passed slaves, who actually owned, who were the slave owners? It's a great question. Um, the wealthy. And so you still, in the ancient world, still had individuals who were wealthy. Um, oftentimes, of course, you've got like um, the, in, in the, in the Latin world of the first century, you had the cursus sonorum, all right? And guys, if you don't like history, just focus in on me, okay? All right, the cursus sonorum is Latin. It means the, the ladder of honor. And so if you were born to a free house, you know, like let's just say, you know, W.T. was a free man. And so he had Tim. Okay, you would start out at 16, and you would have a toga celebration. You would have a big toga party. You know, Tim is a man now. You start out on the very bottom ladder of the cursus and orum. And this is a defined thing. And there's, I forget how many rungs it is, like 12 rungs. And the first thing you do is you start with your dad's business. If you're really ambitious, you join the military. And you start off as like a low um, officer. And then you continue to work your way up. And the higher you work your way up, comes the more power, more money, more prestige, more slaves. And you work your way up that ladder. Now the problem is, you only get to start that ladder if you're a free man and you're an Italian. You know, if you're a Roman. Uh, sometimes they would adopt individuals to be the sons of men who were not Italians, but because they were adopted by Italians, they got to kind of do that. Anybody seen Ben-Hur? Anybody? Kind of same thing. You know, Charleston Heston gets adopted by the dude. He wants to give him his name and his ring and stuff like that. That was pretty common in the ancient world. And so you had wealthy individuals. You had individuals who could buy their freedom. You know, if they were really good. Even if they were a teacher or a nurse, they were still a slave. But if they were really good, they could hoard their money and save it because they were paid. And oftentimes they would save their money to buy their freedom. And then they would kind of be kind of like a... Um, uh, a, co- a contractor, you know, they'd work by contract. They would gain enough money, and then if they gained enough money and support, they'd buy some slaves, and they'd get some more money. And then maybe they'd get Roman citizenship, and maybe their kids could start the cursus in Orem. And so it was like this, like this game, if you will, of trying to get more money, more power, more prestige, then you could have slaves. It was a rare number of people because it was extremely, I mean, uh, if you own a business, right, if you, my dad is a farmer, okay, and uh, he raises crops. Uh, my dad, uh, during the harvest season, he pays between two and three thousand dollars of labor every day. Um, it's a lot of money, you know, every single day. And the harvest season for him is at least five months long. Um, it's expensive, you know, to to upkeep somebody. And so you have to be very wealthy to have slaves in the ancient world. Great, great question. Yes, Miss Holton. Yeah, it was. It was called the Year of Jubilee, and it was only for Hebrew slaves, and it was only done by Hebrews. And the idea was, and also with the Year of Jubilee, if I'm not mistaken, every, um, I think it was every 49th year, every 7th Jubilee, you would have land that would have got bought and sold, and every 49th year, it would go back to the original family. And so uh, it was kind of a way to keep the land divisions that took place when they took the land of Canaan set up and proper. And so... It was really good, though. Like, if you, if you got put in slavery, like in year six, you know, and you had to work for a year, and then you were freed, that's not bad. You know, but if you get put in slavery year two, and you got to work five years, year seven, it's pretty, you know, it's a pretty bad situation. Um, but yes, it was called the year of Jubilee. And you see that passage talking about the year of Jubilee when Jesus comes. That same language of the year of Jubilee, you know, has come. And, he's, and the idea of, well, what, what does that mean? We say the Jubilee. You know, we say that song, like, da, da, heaven's Jubilee. 
Like, some people have no idea what they're talking about. Well, what is the Jubilee? Well, it's the year we're set free, you know, from slavery. Well, somebody tell me how that correlates to Jesus. It's, it's obviously very simple. Freedom of, sin. Freedom, of, yeah, freedom of sin, right? He's our, he's our Jubilee, right? We're, we're free. You know, Romans 6 type stuff. And so, yeah, and so that's what it was. After that seventh year, you mean like uh, the the slaves themselves? Yeah. They would they would go back to whatever they were doing earlier, and so oftentimes somebody that was sold into slavery. I mean, they could have been a they could have been a banker, they could have been a lawyer, they could have been a doctor, they could have been a nurse or a teacher. They had just for some reason either had done something or been so fiscally um, negligent that they found themselves in a financial hole and just just basically. You know, it's like somebody owes you so much money, they just come work for you. But instead of, in the, in the modern world, you give them a paycheck, and in the ancient world, they stayed, they paid off their... Uh, my ancestor, actually, um, came to the United States as a slave, um, as an indentured servant to William Penn, who actually Pennsylvania is named after. Uh, he was an Irish potato farmer, and uh, he sold himself into... Which was, by the, the vast majority of people that came to the United States the first 150 years did the exact same thing. Um, if they weren't wealthy, they would find wealthy people in the United States to pay their boat fare to the U.S. and would work for three, four, five, six, seven years and to earn their freedom. And then, but once they were done, they just did whatever they, whatever trade or skill they had. Great question. Uh, any other questions or comments? Uh, sorry for the history lesson. If you like history, I apologize. Uh, but next week we'll get in the text of Philemon and it'll be a little bit better, I promise. Uh, if we don't mind, let's go ahead and let's close the prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day and for all the many blessings you've given us. We're so thankful for the blessing to live in such a, a country with so much freedom for the idea that we don't have to worry about being slaves uh, to other human beings and have them dictate our actions. But dear Heavenly Father, please help us also to be thankful for the idea that we don't have to be slaves to sin, that because of the gift of your Son, that you have loosened those shackles through his precious blood and help us to not go back into slavery and to sell ourselves once again back in those chains of bondage. Please help us to look to you with love and honor and affection and to seek uh, your honor, glory, and praise, not our own. Dear Heavenly Father, please help us as a congregation to look out for each other and just as the first century church would pull their resources together and by the freedom of their members, please help us to pull our resources together to look out for each other and make sure that none of us are wandering back into the, the uh, shackles of sin. Please be with us and watch over us and help us to also bring individuals in this community, in our neighborhoods who are enslaved to sin, to know the freedom that is in your Son. It's in His name we pray. Amen.